It'll be negative because why? Because the products are more... Exactly. What you're doing is going from weak bonds to strong bonds, which is delta G negative, right? So you're moving down the chart. So that's, that's Sophia's got it exactly right. Delta G negative, therefore it's spontaneous. So what does that mean? It means the bonds in graphite are stronger than the bonds in diamond, because spontaneously diamonds goes to graphite. It means the bonds in the products, carbon dioxide, water, all that stuff of TNT are stronger than the bonds in TNT. So TNT is a weakly bonded molecule. It is unstable. It is weakly bonded. That's what makes it explosive. It's got lots of weak bonds. It would rather, those atoms would rather be bonded in a much stronger way than they are in TNT. Yeah. Ah, that's a really good question. If the bonds in graphite are stronger, why is it softer? That's a, because it turns out the bonds in graphite put the atoms in flat sheets that slide over each other, whereas in diamond, they're actually cross-linked in 3D. So it's actually not just the strength of the bonds, but it's the way the structure is actually built. Yeah? No, is that why diamonds last longer than graphite? Technically, graphite should last longer. Eventually, all your diamonds will turn to graphite if you wait long enough. But long enough means like since the dinosaurs have been around. Right. All right. So that's another big deal. All right, fine. Let us now apply some of this in a variety of ways. Or actually, I'm going to put that aside and talk about... Um, so from last time, given a reaction with delta G minus, therefore it's spontaneous, Therefore, it will happen eventually. Okay. You get one of these free energy diagram thingies that I've been drawing. Um, oops, sorry. Um, high and low, free energy. And if you have some state, uh, state, ah, I think I'm crossing it out, A, and you have some state B, so that reaction is spontaneous, energetically downhill. We talked a little tiny bit about something in the middle, about rate. There'll be some state A, B, some sort of intermediate in between. This thing, let me label these in different colors, make it a little bit clearer. This thing is called a transition state. To give a formal name to that intermediate. It's what it was if we were talking about the snap bracelets. You had sort of... One state was straight, another state was coiled, and that transition state in the middle was that little kink you put in, right, that started it all. So this transition state is an intermediate between A and B, right? So for example, if one state is me bonded here with a weak bond, and another state is me bonded here with a strong bond, there's some intermediate where like I'm partly breaking this one, just starting to make that one on my way over or in go going either way. There's something in between. And that transition state turns out to be key in thinking about the rate. And so if you have this pathway, then this energy here, talked about a little bit before, is the activation energy. EA, and it determines the rate. That is basically the molecules of A with energy greater than EA, with more energy than the activation energy react, to form B, whereas molecules of A with energy less than EA. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just put this one. The other ones don't, that's obvious. The, and so, therefore, more A's with energy greater than EA leads to a faster reaction. That's a general principle. Um, 
So basically, you've got to get over that barrier. So there's molecules of A, and they have a whole bunch of different energies at room temperature. Any molecule of A with the activation, in it, with activation energy or higher can make it over the hill and react. The ones that don't sort of jiggle around and stay as A. All right? Once you get over the hill, you're going to go all the way down to B because it gives you more energy back than you put in. All right? So you might ask, how do you control it? Uh, so, um, so how to speed the reaction? There's two ways. And why does it matter? Because, again, living things, I want to digest my lunch sometime today. And so it needs to happen relatively quickly. And so there are two ways to make reactions happen faster. A is to heat it. And what that does is that leads to higher average energy. That is, you raise energy. Therefore, more molecules with energy greater than activation energy. Um, that is a faster rate. If you like, this is like saying jump higher. That is, if you want to get over the bar, if there's some bar the molecules have to get over, some energy bar, you can either jump higher, right? So more of them, if you jump more vigorously, more of them are going to have energy to get over, so you can jump higher. Heating is one way to do it. So if you heat it up, more molecules have enough energy to, to, to make it over the top. The other way to make the reaction go faster is to um, change the reaction path, change the reaction path to lower the activation energy. It has the same consequence. Therefore, more molecules uh, with energy greater than the activation energy. Therefore, a faster rate. This is like lowering the bar. Right. And this is catalysis. Right. So in living things, if you want to digest your lungs faster, you could just heat it up. Right? Cooking it actually helps to break down the proteins faster. The problem is you can't heat yourself up that hot or you'll cook yourself. So heating things up is not a solution for living things. Catalysts, finding a cheat, making a way to make the reaction easier, making it lowering that activation barrier, basically facilitating this reaction, makes it happen faster. More molecules have enough energy. What I want to do is give you a, a sort of physical example of that to show you, to, to show you what I mean by that, to, to put, it in, put it into practice. So for example, fizzy so, um, so fizzy soda. All right, and the bubbles, what are the bubbles in fizzy soda? CO2, carbon dioxide. Our bubbles are CO2, right? And so you can look at this thermodynamically speaking. There are two states. Number one, CO2 dissolve in water, all right? Number two is CO2 in air, okay? And fizzy soda is mostly one, and flat soda is mostly two. All right, cool. So that therefore, one to two is spontaneous. but it's slow. How do you know it's slow? Because you can leave your cup of soda for a while, half an hour or so, and it's still fizzy. It's less fizzy over time, but it still retains some of its fizz over time. It's, it's not when you take the bottle cap off, all the fizz goes out. I mean, unless you're shaking it up or something like that. So you know it's spontaneous because eventually it will go flat if you wait long enough, but it doesn't happen super fast. So um, let me draw... Uh, one of those energy diagrams, right? 
same deal. G high and low. If I put um, one state here, CO2 in the water, given that soda goes flat, I think this is the, I want to have you guys think about this one because it's just, make sure the delta C stuff is easy to get mixed in. I want to know the line for, so this is fizzy soda, it's carbon dioxide dissolved in water. Where does the line go for, flat, for carbon dioxide in the air compared to this, above or below that one? So think about it. This is a quickie. Think about it. Talk to your neighbor. Where does the line, where should I draw the line for carbon dioxide um, in the air? After, so state number two. Um, based on what you know about delta G and the fact that it's spontaneous, blah, blah, blah. How does it, so how can you translate that into a diagram like this? I want to know, is it above the same height or below? 